thank you for your interest in watching or listening to this sermon preached at North Point Baptist Church. Our hope is that our preaching ministry serves you well. We do, however, wish to strongly discourage you from using this or any other of our sermons as your primary means of spiritual nourishment. We urge that you would seek this spiritual nourishment in the context of a local church under the care of pastors and members who know and love you. May our contribution to your spiritual life in this sermon be only a small supplement to the ministry at your local church. Blessings in Christ, the elders of North Point Baptist Church, Nairobi. Our sermon this morning will come from Judges chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. Judges chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. We continue from where we stopped. And if you are able to, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. I'm reading from the ESV version. Now, these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that that generation of the people of Israel might know war to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, these are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon from Mount Bel Bal Hamon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. And that is the word of the Lord. May you may be seated. Uh, blacksmith, uh, blacksmithing is a nut or trade that has become obsolete in our generation. More so because of the development of superior equipment and machinery that do not require the human hand. If you are here and would wish to pursue a hobby or career in blacksmithing, you only need a few, a handful of tools. One, you need a forge. A forge is the furnace. The forge is perhaps the most important tool to have. It is the furnace or the jiko in Kiswahili, used to heat metallic sub substances at very high temperatures. The high temperatures are needed to smelt metal and make them malleable so that they can be easily shipped. Secondly, you need an anvil. This is another important tool with a flat surface. It is extremely hardened and has the ability to withstand some of the toughest hammering, allowing the heated material to be hammered into the desirable shapes. Thirdly, you need a hammer. They come in various shapes and sizes and should be able to withstand high degrees of temperatures and pounding. They are useful in shaping the metal. Finally, you need tongs. A steady set of tongs are useful in handling and moving the extreme hot materials from one place to the other. Now I said, finally, no, there is something else. You need vices. Uh, these vices hold the metallic objects into a grip, allowing a steady sh shaping. But that is enough for a metallurgy class. 
Evidently, a blacksmith is in need of a variety of tools that allow him to be effective to achieve precision in the work he does. God, like a master blacksmith, is in the business of shaping a people for himself. He has a large toolbox with a variety of tools that he uses for this very work. In our sermon this morning, God is like allowing us to enter into his large heated workshop, allowing us to have a glimpse of the various tools he uses. He only allows us to see the variety of tools. He also explains to us the whole reason he's doing so. Like every blacksmith, the objects of his shaping do not some time turn out in the desirable shape as a passage will help us see. However, this is not the, the end of the work, but rather an opportunity to return the metals to the furnace for another reshaping. Because God is committed to this very work, he will use whatever means possible to achieve this very end. He strives for perfection and nothing less. The process if often, is often long, strenuous, and very painful, especially to the recipients. But it has to be done. Whatever God begins, he finishes. It is this in mind that I want to convince you that your testing is very important and necessary. And God will do whatever it takes to fulfill his ultimate purpose. And what is ultimate purpose? His glory. He's not willing to compromise. So to help us navigate through this thought, I have titled my sermon, No Testing, No Glory. No Testing, No Glory. So I have divided my sermon into three points. The instruments of testing, one. The reason of testing and the very failure of testing. Now, the book of Judges properly begins in chapter 2, verse 11. And the part we have just read is almost a repetition of what he had said in verses 21 and 23 of chapter 2. In that part, God states that he will no longer drive out the nations that surround people of Israel. Part of the reason why God would not do so was because of the persistent disobedience that these people exhibited, as we saw last week. The nations were therefore allowed to remain as a chastisement for their disobedience. On the other hand, the Lord allowed the nations to remain as a means of testing testing them to see whether they would walk in the ways of the Lord or not. Verse 22 reveals Canaan had been promised to be a land of full, I mean, a land full of milk and honey, right? Yet as you read through these passages, what emerges is not what one would expect of milk and honey. A land of abundance or prosperity. It seems to us that the inhabitants to be, uh, 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 I mean, it seems to us, and of course, these inhabitants, it's a land of pain and suffering. It is a crucible for testing and making these people a better lot. So how did God plan to achieve this? And this leads us to the first point. The instruments of testing. So, our passage this morning continues where we left again last week. Chapter 2 had highlighted for us that the people of Israel had abandoned God and served the gods of the nations around them, right? So, it is not surprising that they are being punished for this. What is rather surprising and strange is that God is using that very people he wanted destroyed as instruments to achieve certain objectives and purposes. God will use these idolatrous nations as a means of both chastising 
and testing the people of Israel. What? What? This doesn't make sense, does it? God is willing and able to, I mean, God is actually willing and able to use evil people to accomplish good and good for his people that he loves. Does this rattle you? Does it bother you? Is that outside of the way you think about spiritual things? But before I proceed, brothers and sisters, let me state that this, that God is not the author of evil. Although God is not the author of sin, he uses sin to accomplish his eternal purposes. Sin in his people. Sin in the world. Many other times we have this notion in our mind that there exist two sovereign gods. One, God is good. And what do we call him? God, our God. With capital G. And the, one, the other one is evil. And what do we call him? Satan. Right? Even though we may not say it or hardly think about it, we ascribe all good things and good people to this God, our God. But all bad things and all evil people are ascribed to Satan. Isn't that what we reason? Yet, brothers and sisters, uh, this is not the picture that Bible presents to us. A good example would be Joseph in Genesis 5.20, when God turned the evil in Joseph's brothers for the salvation of many. God in Joseph used Potiphar, who was evil, for Joseph's good when she lied about him, leading to his jail. But God eventually turned this into good. God raised Pharaoh to us this end also, to display his power so that God's name would be proclaimed in all the earth. Elsewhere, God would use Cyrus, an evil pagan king, to supply what is necessary to the building of the temple. He actually worked in his heart to achieve this end. Don't we see that with Judas in the betrayal of our Savior? And the Pharisees and all those who participated in uh, his killing? Without their participation, we wouldn't have had the crucifixion. And of course, our salvation. We wouldn't be here celebrating the Lord's Supper. God used the evil people to achieve his redemptive plan. Brothers and sisters, in our sovereign God's toolbox, there contains all manner of tools, everything geared towards his purpose. God, the creator of the universe, is sovereign over all, and therefore has the right to use whatever he chooses to use. God can use evil people because after all, evil people are his. God can use animals, actually. After all, animals or creatures are his. You'll see such a thing in uh, Joshua 24 when he used the hornet to defeat uh, Israelites' armies, enemies. Or the whale. Everyone of us knows the whale. In the story of Jonah, to teach him some lessons, didn't he? God can use circumstances, including calamities, as he pleases. Because even that is under his mighty hand. God can use the sea to bring down the Egyptian army. He used the flood to judge the world. And in these last days, he will use fire for the final judgment. If God were a blacksmith, the people of Israel would be the metal being shaped or molded. But the nations would be the arsenal of tools at his disposal to put them in shape. We should not therefore be surprised that God chooses to use evil people. In our context, if you look at verse 5, 
he lists for us the names. And actually, you'll find these names repeated over and over again, even in the uh, previous, uh, in Joshua, in Exodus, and also in Deuteronomy. What we have here is a list of Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, that is in verse 5, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I am sure if you are to study each nation's peculiarity, you may discover that they were carefully selected by God himself to achieve specific objectives. Some were hammers, some were forges, some were the anvil, and others were the tongs. These were instruments in the Redeemer's hands. You will notice that these people were godless as it were, and perhaps savages, a ferocious, brutal, and ruthless people. They had to be this way. For what end? To shape character in God's people. We can tell this because God would use them to train the people of Israel in war. So God had to choose a warlike nations, warlike nations for this very purpose. The nations that were here had actually fought the people of Israel before. They were experienced fighters. Thus, this is not the first time they are encountering them. In all the past battles, it is God who handed them over to the people of Israel. The Israelites did not have to do much, but rely on God himself. So relying on God, by all estimation, as you will see, is not easy. It calls for some profound faith, which in many cases is lacking in each and every one of us. Even though this passage sounds bleak and gloomy, as you may see, there seems to be a ray of hope that one can easily miss. And what is that ray of hope? That everything is under God's control. Nothing is beyond him. He knows what he's doing. And what hope is that? Brothers and sisters, we all understand that our God is loving. He's merciful. He's good. He cares for his people immensely. He's not like a child with a loaded gun or a drunken driver handed the keys to a Ferrari. God's ultimate purpose is his glory and the salvation of his people is closely tied to that glory. God is not reckless in what he is doing. He is careful with the selection of instruments that he will use. He can be trusted. So where am I going with this? You may be asking. Where am I going with this? And this leads us to some points of application. And especially to my Christian friends. Do you understand God's whole purpose for saving you? Do you understand it is not for your comfort, but to shape you ultimately into the image of his son, Jesus Christ? This perspective emphasizes the primary aim of salvation. It is not to make us really comfortable, right? Or solve all our problems in this life. But rather, is to transform us to be more like Jesus Christ in character, attitude, and action. This transformation is seen a lifelong process that occurs through the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer in what we call sanctification. Now, considering this perspective, are there challenging circumstances in your life right now? Are there individuals in your life whom God has allowed to bring trouble to you, making your life unbearable, and you wish they were never there in the first place? 
This could be your difficult spouse, perhaps your naughty and cheeky children, difficult colleagues at your workplace, or even a demeaning, demanding boss, or a boda boda rider who cuts you off from the shoulder of the road. They could be your siblings, parents, or relatives, or neighbors, people who you did not choose, but whom God has intentionally placed in your life. Of course, my assumption here is that you could also be the instrument that God is using to shape others. (laughs) I could be that hammer for you, or the tongs with very sharp edges, you know. (laughs) <laughs> so we hardly see ourselves as such and that's how sinful we are in all our dealings we are the ones always sinned against and that is a product of sin as you reflect on these relationships can you identify individuals who seem to embody characteristics of Jebusites Canaanites Hivites or Amorites Perhaps take time actually to study the characters of these particular individuals that are listed here. We don't have time to do that right now. But they symbolize challenges or obstacles you face. What if you are to realize that God has placed them as painful as they may be and as evil as they look as his instruments to shape you to become more and more like your savior? Would that change the way you view such persons? Please ponder over that. I'm certain you can identify a Jebusite in your neighborhood or home or a Canaanite in the supermarket or that road at the road or a Hivite at your workplace or an Amorite among your relatives. This reality, definitely, brothers and sisters, should lead us to thankfulness. He is a master physician and just knows the right dose for each and every one of us. Personally, I believe I have recently been exposed to some Jebusites, especially in the governing authorities or the Kenyan police, especially the traffic, the traffic police. You'll agree with me, anyone who has encountered some of these people, that they are character shapers, right? testing and stretching your patience to the limits, proving your lack of humility and shattering your reliance on God that you end actually end up bribing sometimes. Before I, you think I'm exaggerating about the police, I have just done like a small excerpt on the Jebusites. Hear how the Jebusites are characterized. The Jebusites maintained control over Jebus, Jerusalem, I mean, that is Jerusalem, for a long time, even after other parts of Canaan had been conquered. This could indicate a resistance to change or reluctance to give up control. Symbolically, this might represent challenges that involve involve overcoming entrenched resistance or habits. Doesn't that describe some of our police officers? Yes, it does. Now, what about in our church community? By his grace, Jesus is the one who sovereignly builds his church and determines the people who come into our lives. We are not the, we are not the ones who determine that, do we? Ours is to just as members is to exercise an authority that Christ himself has given to us. So the church has people from all manner of background, shapes, and colors. And of course, diverse temperaments. What we saw last week, all of us are closely related to the pagan nations than to the Jews, right? We therefore carry much baggage from our backgrounds. So why do we have such a bunch of people with myriad flows and doing life closely with each other? And the answer is mainly 
to shape you and I to the image of Christ for his glory. How do you learn to love apart from living with unlovely people? How do you learn to forgive unless you live with people who need forgiveness? How do you learn to be how selfish you can be unless you live closely with needy people around you? And who required something to share with, I mean, I mean, that required you to share with something with them. How do you learn patience unless you do life with people who will stretch it? All in all, what I'm saying is that we need a community of people to shape us and grind off some of our rough edges. We are so flawed that God has to use a variety of instruments for this very end. Northwind members, do you now see why that brother or sister rubs you the wrong way? Do you tend to ask those who you like and like are like you? While that is not wrong in and of itself, the opposite could be true. That you easily avoid those that irritate you or those you have to really work hard to love. That you avoid them altogether. Thereby escaping a character shaping moment. So, but why would a good God and a, and a loving one, for that matter, use such instruments, especially the brutal ones, to cause so much pain and suffering? And this leads us to the second point. The reason for testing. The reason for testing. Any teacher will tell you, Bella is here, that tests are not for the sake of the teacher, but for the benefit of the student. Now look with me the reasons God gives as to why he left these nations. He tells us to teach them war, that in verse 2. He also tells us in verse 4 to test them and know whether the children of Israel would obey God's commands. So those are the two reasons that are alluded to here. So let us look at each reason separately to teach them all. What could this mean? When God, the Bible is telling us to teach them war, what does that mean? So why would God want this generation to learn the art of war? Does he want them to learn how to throw a javelin or ride a horse of war or hold and use a spear or sword? Or perhaps it's how to use a shield or bows and arrows. In this context, the writer does not mean teaching strategies of attack and defense or the method of subduing an enemy. No, that is not what he wants us to see. Literally, God means to teach the Israelites to trust him, to obey him, to rely on him as they experience what means to be at war. If they went back to their history, they would have discovered that it is not by their might or by their power that they would defeat their enemies. If they relied on themselves, they certainly would fail. If you read Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 10, we see that God did not choose Israel because they were strong or mighty. In fact, God chose Israel when they were small and weak. And without land. In fact, two of the first major battles that Israel won were won on the basis of one thing, obedience. The wall of Jericho, everyone knows from Sunday school, was brought down without the use of any weapons. The only weapon they had was God himself, right? All the children of Israel had to do was to rely on God's power, and they were safe. The other major battle was the city of Ai, the defeat of the city of Ai. Here, if you read, Achan's sin led to the defeat of the Israelites. Yet when the sin was purged and Achan and his family punished, God awarded them victory. So the intention behind teaching them war was to educate the new generations of Israel to rely on God, their only hope in war. So the presence of the enemy in the land was an opportunity 
for teaching, testing, and trusting. So the second reason that God gives is to test them and know whether the children of Israel would obey God's commands or not. Right? So numerous figures in the Bible experience testing as part of their calling. For instance, Abraham was tested when God asked him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Moses was tested in his leadership role as he led the Israelites out of Egypt and through the wilderness. Joseph faced various trials, including betrayal by his brothers and in imprisonment in Egypt, before ultimately fulfilling his purpose. What do these stories illustrate for us? They illustrate that testing often precedes God's calling on individuals' lives. In the context of this passage, test refers to a challenging or difficult situation or difficult people that reveal someone's true character. Verse 4 that collaborates with verse 1 fleshes out for us the details of this testing. It is very specific to see whether Israel would obey the commandments of God. Do you think God was surprised by the outcome? Certainly not. Even before testing, God knew. He already knew their hearts and inclinations. By testing them, God was proving to them where their allegiance was so that perhaps they could repent and painfully so. But to understand this fact, one must remember that the people of Israel had been instructed to completely destroy the nations around them. But they failed, as we saw last Sunday. So when Joshua in chapter 24, if you go read, when he took the people down their history and pointed to them, God's faithfulness, he called them to make a choice between serving God or the gods of the nations. And what did the people of Israel say? They vowed to serve the Lord because he was their God. And this is what they were being tested for. And this is very helpful for us because it helps us realize it was not accidental that they served the baths and bowed to them. It was a deliberate choice that they had made. They had two options, to serve the faithful and loving God of their forefathers or serve the foreign gods who are not gods at all. Uh, painfully, they chose the latter. And of course, this is not the first thing time we see this um, situation in the Bible. Don't we see that in the Garden of Eden? God, even though had created Adam and Eve, he gave them a free will to either choose to obey him or not. And either of the options given had certain consequences. And the first choice, I mean, the choice that our first parents made has had an effect on us to date. So allowing these nations to remain and eventually serving their gods was a choice the Israelites made. They had made their bed. They had to lay on it. God gave them up to their choices. But perhaps, possibly, God was using these nations to teach them the outcome of their disobedience or prove their weaknesses or their lack of trust in him. Now, let us bring it to our lives. In our lives, we likely face or encounter two types of tests. And of course, which often comes without warning or an instruction manual. These tests are the test of adversity and the test of prosperity. And each has a default trajectory concerning our relationship with God. So the test of adversity tends to the lead us towards faith in God. So when we face circumstances that are clearly beyond our resources, what do we do? We turn to God for help. When we are beyond our abilities or understanding, we turn towards God for wisdom 
of breakthrough. In these moments, we draw nearer to God, discovering aspects of him that we might not have learned otherwise. And of course, brothers and sisters, as painful as it is, anything that leads us to the feet of Jesus, however painful it is, is good for us. Because at the feet of Jesus is the best place to be. On the other hand, the test of prosperity often leads us away from God. When we have the provision we need and receive the things we have prayed for, how do we react? How do we behave after God has answered or given to us that very things that we were praying for? Ideally, we should be drawn deeper into a relationship with God. We should be more grateful. Yet sadly, many times this is not the case. To my Christian friend, how is God testing you through the blessing that he has given to you? For parents, you really prayed for your, a, a child or children. So how has the blessing of children hindered you from serving others? Have they been a reason for lack of meaningful uh, membership? That spouse that you really fasted for and prayed for could be the very reason you have slackened in your Christian work. You no longer in, you are no longer in need. You are happy as it can ever be. Marcy and um, Kevin are not here, but I'm not talking about them. So has the blessing of the job or contract you had been searching for affected your availability and service to the church? What about the blessing of a car? Has it aided your Christian work in any way? By the way, uh, our American friends, in, in, in our country, a car is a blessing. <laughs> it's not a necessity. <laughs> it's a luxury. <laughs> Has it aided you in coming to church early? You know, when you are coming here with a matatu, you are saying, God, every time, every, if you ever give me a car, <laughs> I'll be on ch- in church actually at eight. Because now I'll not have to burn two or three matatus. Here you are, you have a car. Have you fulfilled that promise? Brothers and sisters, it is not only adversity that tests our our faith, but prosperity as well. But perhaps you are wondering, what is the location of these tests? How does God test me? Where do these tests occur? The Bible tells us it takes place in our hearts. But why the heart? The Bible teaches that the heart is the very essence of who we are and the focal point of our worship. All sin and idolatry in us emanates from here. And that's the whole reason God would tell Samuel as he was in the process of choosing the anointing king in 1 Samuel 16 to 7. And this is what he says. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. But what does the God look, I mean, what, what does the Lord look for? But the Lord looks at the heart. God is more interested with our hearts than anything else. Let's turn to a few verses we see that uh, concept. Turn to Proverbs 17.3. Proverbs 17.3. Proverbs 17.3, uh, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and the Lord tests hearts. Turn with me again to Psalm 26. Psalms is just before Proverbs. Uh, Psalms 26 verse 2. And this is David saying, prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. 
Oh, Jeremiah 17.10. Jeremiah 17.10. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Testing is a means by which God evaluates the faith, obedience, and commitment of his followers. And the tests are done in our hearts, our core. This is necessary. This is very important. Testing serves to refine and strengthen the character of believers. And just as gold is purified in the fire, testing purges impurities and strengthens faith. Here are the words of James. James chapter 1, 2 to 4. He speaks about this idea. And what does he tell uh, the Christians there? James 1, 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The idea that everyone whom God calls undergoes testing underscores the transformative nature of God's calling and the importance of perseverance, faithfulness, and trusting in fulfilling his purposes. Through testing, believers are refined, strengthened, and prepared to embrace the calling God has placed on their lives. Now, to my non-Christian friend, where do you go when you are faced with all manner of trouble? Where do you go to when you encounter troublesome persons? How do you handle such situations? Do you realize God could be using such people or circumstances to punish you and drive you to him? While for us Christians, trials and hardships are forms of disciplines, for you, non, my non-Christian friend, trials and hardships are not tests but there are punishments to harden you against God, leading you to the ultimate eternal punishment. So dear friend, don't twist such moments as needless as they could be. Please use those moments to cry out to God, to soften your heart. May those moments be the very moments that lead you to God himself rather than away from him. Turn and ask God for forgiveness. And because he's a gracious and a good God, it pleases him to forgive you. Now, did these pay tests improve the people of Israel? Did they pass the test? Let us always remember that it is not about testing, a passing, but rather it is about faithfulness. And this leads us to the third and final point. Failure in our testing. In verse 5 and 6, the passage ends on a very low note. And what happened? Uh, the people of Israel failed the test. Don't we see that? This passage ends up with a very, at a very low note. They not only intermarried with the nations, but they served their gods as well. And this pattern is repeated in the entire book of Judges. They abandoned God who had brought them out of Egypt. Why did they fail, you may ask? Isn't this something we learned last Sunday? They failed because they are sinners through and through. The standard that God had set for them were extremely high. And to sin is to miss the target that God has set for them. Without God's intervention, these standards were unattainable. And that's the whole message God wants them to learn. He wants them to learn this message. 
that in and of themselves, they lacked any hope to meet these high demands that God had placed on them. An Israelite reading this passage would despair or even of even trying because the odds were so much against him or her. How, brothers and sisters, how could they survive the enticements of the nations on one hand and on the other resist the arm of the almighty God that was against them? What are we to do with such an eventuality? Clearly, the Israelites were a desperate lot. Isn't this the same story of our lives? Don't we have people or painful circumstances that God has sovereignly allowed to remain in our lives? Aren't we often faced with sad, dire, and unrelenting situations and springs of comfort to die, to fail, sorry? Haven't we prayed time and again for the thorn to be taken away? And we all find ourselves doing, all we find ourselves doing is failing and sinning. And we ask ourselves, when will this ever end? When will I ever get it right? When will I become like Job in my testing and react righteously when others wrong me or mistreat me or hurt me? Why am I the one who seems to be tested so much than others? Well, the answer would be because you are deeply loved by the king of the universe. You have a good opportunity than others to showcase his goodness. Didn't Job serve this very purpose? As we read his story. Of course, we ask ourselves, when will I ever learn to forgive and love my enemies and do good to them? Honestly, you sincerely strongly desire to please the Lord. But all you have to show for it is a scorecard that is full of misses than scores. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Just like the Israelites, all we can show for it is failure after failure. In Psalm 139, 23 to 24, you don't need to turn there. David prays this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is not a prayer you want to make when faced with a, such a cloud of fail or sin. Because the answer is there, right there with you. He has tested you, and he has found you wanting. Have you ever been in such a place before? Or are you there at this moment? And of course, at such moments, who among us would dare make such a prayer to God? Without some level of fear or shame. Like your shadow, your sin seems to follow you so closely. Our God is omniscient and knows us thoroughly. He knows us better than ourselves. He knows our many weaknesses and predispositions. If God was to treat us as our sins deserve, who would survive? None of us. So God has placed us in the world, yet he tells us not to love the things of the world or anything in it. Surely, surely. Can anyone here stand and authoritatively say, I have passed this test? None. The Bible commands us to abstain, abstain from fleshly lusts that war, wage war against our souls. Can anyone here with their heads lifted high say they have not loved the world or are not currently entangled with it? Brothers and sisters, without the grace of God, we are unable to resist the flesh and its many desires. It is very strong for us. Who is strong enough to endure the testing from such a God and pass? 
with flying colors, so to speak. God demands a hundred percent score. Ninety nine point nine 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 is a fail. He demands perfection. He demands a hundred percent. And then, of course, the verdict is out there. None of us can pass that test. The standards that God has set for us are extremely high. His glory and our glory cannot be compromised. Be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. Jesus commands in Matthew 5, 48, even in our afflictions. He who is holy commands holiness in us as well. Before you despair, our God is a compassionate and merciful God. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our weak frame. He does not test us so that we can pass the test because we can never. He tests us so that we can look back to him and cry for help. Through the gospel, God has made a way out for for us without compromising his holiness or his demand of our perfection. God demands holiness and perfection, and he gave us his son. Hallelujah. God did not defeat the nations, but allowed them to remain, to test the Israelites, yet they failed, as we have seen. And just like the Israelites, God sent his son, Emmanuel, God with us, to dwell among his enemies. And just like the Israelites, God used these very sinful and evil nations to test him. And just like the people he came to save, he learned obedience from what he suffered in the hands of sinful men. Ultimately, the cross was the means God used to not only test the one he loved, but also was the very means that ended his life. And you know what? Brought us our salvation. Through the cross, Jesus proved perfect. He had obeyed his father perfectly. Let's turn to Hebrews 5, 12, we see this. The Hebrew writer captures this very well. Hebrews 5, 12. And this is what he says. Sorry, uh, it's not Hebrews 5, 12. Um, It is in the, I've written Hebrews. In the last day, in the days, let me just read the passage. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was hard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. God used our Lord's enemies to prove and approve him as the perfect one. God made him who had not seen to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Only in Christ can failures like you and I pass God's test. What God, what a God, what a savior we have in Jesus Christ. And this is the wonderful news of the gospel. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our righteous and most holy God, we invite you to test our hearts. Not so that we can pass but so that we can see our many flaws and weaknesses. 
And oh Lord, may this always lead us to our Savior, in whose merit we stand. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.